Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren, and sisters. We're going to have all of you back along with us here with our uh, Sunday a.m. sermon. And we thank the Lord for his grace and for his mercy and all that he's uh, done for us for allowing us to come back and to gather in his name and to do his work and to follow in his will. And uh, we are certainly happy to have you with us. And uh, we pray that uh, you get a blessing this morning, as we always get a blessing from the Word of God, not because I preach it, but because it is God's Word and it is amazing. Amen. And of course, looking at uh, probably my favorite chapter in the book of Psalms here, Psalm 19, probably Psalm 19 and Psalm 119 uh, being my two favorite chapters because uh, they are about the Word of God. And I would certainly do love the Word of God here, as, you know, that's the name of this ministry here, Word Awakening. And so uh, <clears throat> we look forward to what the Lord has for us here. A few prayer requests to also pray for my wife. She's had some bad back pain the last few days. Uh, so uh, keep uh, Jennifer Cooper in your prayers. Also, uh, my daughter has a couple of appointments. And uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, uh, she has a... Uh, a doctor's appointment tomorrow to get a uh, to get a flu shot, and I know that's very routine. But my daughter is only five years old, and she is terrified of needles. That's always a challenge when we go do that. And also, she will be going to the dentist for the first time this coming Tuesday. Uh, so, uh, and that'll be the first time she's ever gone to a dentist. And like I've said before, my daughter is a very very introverted person, and so uh, so I uh, pray for uh, pray for her in those in those aspects. And uh, let's do pray one for another. Pray that our God would be with us. I've also got a special request as well that I wish you'd pray for. Of course, we always pray one for another because I know there are many needs out there. And uh, so uh, we lift them up uh, to the Lord. Also, I've not said this in a little while, but if you have a prayer request or anything, our email address is there in the description box. So if, uh, you know, anything you want us to pray for, you want us to mention on here, not mention on here uh, live. <clears throat> Or uh, if you've got a praise report or a question, you know, concern or anything about, uh, you know, about the, uh, you know, about what we do here, like a theological or biblical question, you want more resources or anything, we'll do everything that uh, we can to help you. And like also, I've not, I don't always do this, but uh, also in the description box, we'll put a link to some of the commentaries that I've written. That that uh, that I've written and they're extremely cost effective. They're only a they're only a few dollars. I make no profit off of that. All you pay really is just the cost of printing, and so uh, we'll put that in the description as well. And so uh, and so we'll uh, go ahead and we'll pray for all these things and for one another. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Thank thank you for all that you've done, all the blessings you've bestowed upon our hearts and lives. We thank you for this ministry. And we pray, Lord, for faithfulness. We pray that we'd ever be faithful, Lord God, to what you'd have us to do. And we do thank you for our salvation, for calling us according to your purpose. And we pray that you'd meet with us here on this day and that you'd lift us up, help us, and encourage us. Do that mighty work in us, Lord, that only you can do. Just help the brethren and the sister in the faith, we pray. Just give us that which we need, Lord God, and grow our ministries as you see fit, Lord. Give us souls for our labor most of all. And I'll be with my wife, Lord God, and her physical ailments, and my daughter with these couple of appointments coming up, and all those out there, Lord, on the bed of affliction uh, for the special request that we have, all those that stand in need. I know uh, this year many have been affected that have lost jobs and things that have been hurt financially. And uh, we pray for uh, our, you know, for the United States, for this country, for Canada, for uh, the United Kingdom and all countries around the world. As I know, we've had a, a tough year this year worldwide that you'd be with all of our listeners. Just bless them and help them, Lord, like only you can. And for it's in Christ, bless them. And we do pray. Help us this morning. Amen. And amen. And also... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Just uh, by way of announcement, uh, like we've been saying, uh, some of our uh, other books that we've uh, that we're going to have put in print and be published. I know that's been delayed, but we're going to try to do that within the next couple of weeks. Uh, with a uh, COVID nineteen and other things that I've had going on, like our local libraries around here have been closed, but I think they're back open now, and we're going to try to do that within within the next couple of weeks. I've got a lot going on this coming week, so I might not get to it this week, but next week we're going to try to at least publish the book that we wrote, the Ministry of Prayer and Fasting. Also, a number of other commentaries that uh, that were that were that that are that are ready to be published. All I really have to do is just uh, email them uh, to our publisher. Like with uh, well, I not only have to email them, but I also have to put them in a book format. That's why they've been delayed. I have to go to the library to do that because I can't do that on my own laptop. But like a commentary on Nahum and Habakkuk, a commentary on the Song of Solomon, and on uh, on Micah and Jonah, and also the book of Amos, so I've got quite a few here that are also in the process here that are ready to uh, to be published. I just got to put them in that but to a book format, so we'll try to do that as soon as we can. Like I said, the next couple of weeks, we're trying to get the ball rolling on that, and so it's great to be busy for the Lord. Of course, we'll be back preaching tonight, continuing our series on humility, 
And uh, so we uh, look forward to that preaching in voice and in sign language. And on Tuesday, we're still going through the uh, Old Testament survey. We're about halfway through the book of Deuteronomy. And like we said, we're going to take a break from our Thursday uh, from our Thursday studies, at least at least for a while with all the other things that we have going on. We just completed uh, some of the minor prophet books. But we will still be going through uh, through our Friday study, as I said. Uh, as we've been saying now, we're going to start a uh, we're going to start a series about separation from worldliness. And so, of course, this coming Friday, we'll be doing Halloween and how we need to separate from a Halloween. So we look forward to that and all that the Lord has for us. And so just to continue to pray, as then as we know that God will always meet our needs, that's what my desire is, is to just do the work of God and do what the Lord would uh, would have us to do. And uh, we've also not, I know we kind of mentioned it, but not given a good description of it, uh, but uh, just kind of with our ministry here, of course, I do this in preaching and teaching, but I'm also a church planner. Uh, that is you know, kind of the vast array of our work. We are church planners up to northern New York, up in Franklin County, uh, right next to the Canadian border. I was a, a church planner over in Ontario, Canada, uh, back from 2016 to 2017, but our visa wasn't approved uh, to uh, stay in Canada, so we came out for a couple of years, and uh, and uh, we're not in a full-time ministry, but prayed and seek the will of God, and the Lord led us back up right next to the border uh, to where we were and have given us a great, great burden for that area. God called burden. You know, we see now like how the Lord, how the Lord worked things out, you know, how the Lord used a lot of this to mold me and make me and to break me. And I have a have a uh, have a desire for another great awakening, for another revival, and uh, that's kind of why we've given the name of uh, of this, you know, uh, preaching, teaching, and writing ministry. Word awakening, because we have, of course, the word of God, which I love, and then great awakening, and you know, those are two things that coincide: the word of God and and revival. And uh, just like uh, back in the 1800s with that second great awakening, uh, much of that revival, like by uh, Charles Finney, Abel Clary, and Daniel Nash, was in upstate New York. Like we're actually going just uh, just kind of north uh, northeast, like of where Abel Clary and Daniel Nash are both buried, who were both best friends of Charles Finney. I know they're not really well known in church history. They didn't write books or anything, but they were great prayer warriors. You know, that's the other part of revival. Like we said, the Word of God, and we know prayer. <laughs> Excuse me, <coughs> but uh. Abel Clary and Daniel Nash were uh, Charles Finney's best friends or were his prayer warriors. They were both natives of northern New York. Like if Charles Finney was ever preaching a meeting in that area, uh, like around upstate New York, they'd always go there and pray and fast. About two weeks prior would do nothing but just pray and fast. You know, and that's what it takes to have a revival. You know, it, it costs. You know, it's it's a cost. There are a lot of churches now, but, you know, that's why we don't have a revival. I was actually just reading some of that this morning, an article by Dr. David Cloud. You know, we don't, you know, we don't see a great movie of God like we did before, you know, even though we have Bible-believing churches, you know, our doctrine is really better than, you know, it was really better than the revival store of the Great Awakening. Most of those people were Arminians or Calvinists, you know, they were off on some things, but, you know, we have, I think, all the right doctrine, but, you know, we just miss the heart. Yeah, you know, that's it. We miss the heart. You know, that's why we don't have a revival, because, you know, where's our heart at? You know, like I just, you know, give a description of those men of God through the Second Great Awakening. You know, they spent all their times praying, fasting, studying the Bible. You know, and unfortunately, we have so many people now, you know, they give God a few minutes out of a day, if that. You know, they don't spend any time in prayer, don't spend time in the Word of God. You know, just don't have a heart for it. You know, unfortunately, even preachers, you know, they just don't have a heart, you know, for the Word of God to spend hours in the Word of God. That's what it takes. You know, that's what those men did. You know, that, that's what the most thing that I get out of those revivals was the lifestyle that those men lived. You know, they lived the lifestyle. You know, they spent hours in the Word of God, hours in prayer, you know, and fasting. Like, fasting is something that, you know, is almost unheard of in this day and time, but it's very biblical. You know, and God's choice of servants made much of fasting. You know, that's why the Lord led me to write that book. That's actually the first book that I've ever written. Funny thing is, I actually kind of lost that book. I started writing that line before, you know, we ever moved to Canada. And, uh... Like a lot of, you know, what uh, what helped me with that book was, you know, that second great awakening, like in upstate New York, you know, about prayer and fasting. But then I actually thought, I thought I had lost that book, but I still had it on, on my thumb drive. Like I said, I wrote that book all the way back in 2014, but then I just found that book back earlier this year, like in the earlier parts of 2020, and I was like, wow. And so, you know, I think that's just kind of how the Lord works with us going up to that area now. And that's also one thing we're going to do is we're also going to do a church history tour or maybe a revival history tour would be better. You know, going to go to, go to the graves of Daniel Nash and Abel Clary and some.
some of those other areas, like where Charles Finney ministered, where he had revival, you know, like I know in western New York, you know, was also a great part of that. <clears throat> and so we look forward to all that and what the Lord has for us up there. And you pray for us as we uh, plan to move in the springtime, like uh, we were going to move this fall, but, you know, COVID-19 put us behind with raising our support and, you know, also moving to New York. <clears throat> like that's going to be a... Uh, a bit of a challenge, but you, uh, but you, uh, pray for us, pray that all this kind of COVID-19 and all is over enough, you know, we've, you know, is over enough uh, by this springtime so that we can move, amen, and so you pray for us as we're certainly praying for everybody out there, I know there are other, you know, other ministries out there, like other people who support our ministry, who are also church planners, and we're very thankful for those people, and I uh, thank God for the burden that he has, uh, that he's given us for the area, Amen. And so Psalm 19 is where we've been here. We've been we started a series here on Psalm, uh, going through the book of Psalm earlier this year. I think I think we started uh, uh, like we started this ministry here, preaching and teaching like uh, like online uh, back earlier this year, like in January, February. And uh, we preached a couple of messages, and then we started uh, going through the Psalms. We this was about the I think maybe the third uh, like the uh, third Sunday morning sermon that we did. Uh, we started with Psalm one, so we've been going. Through through this at least in March, even February or March, I believe is like when we started uh, this ministry here, uh, started going through the book of Psalms. And so uh, here we're on a 19. We go a little slow, but you know, I think that's, uh, but we're biblical though. You know, we might go a little slow because, you know, it's expository preaching. You know, we look at every phrase. We don't over miss anything. We get all that we can out of the word of God. That's kind of, you know, my, I guess maybe if I had a motto for my lifestyle, that could be one of them. I get all that I can out of the word of God. And so we, uh, we go a little slow maybe, but, uh, you know, but we, we get all we can out of the word of God though. That's the purpose of it. And so we actually started this message last Sunday, the glory of God's word, which is Psalm 19, 7 through 14. Of course, our previous message was uh, the glory of God's creation. That was the first six verses here of Psalm, of Psalm 19, because they're really those two different halves. The first six verses talk about the glory of the Lord's creation, and then verses 7 to 14 are about the glory of God's word. And we covered verses 7 and 8 last Sunday. In the first part of this message, and now here on the second part, uh, we're going to do verses 9 to 11. So do verses 9 to 11, and then maybe next week uh, we'll finish up the uh, we'll finish up the 19th Psalm with verses 12 to 14. But this morning, though, looking at verses 9 to 11, we'll uh, we'll read verse 9 to get us started. It says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And so here. Uh, Looking at uh, continuing the sermon here, the glory of God's word, the glory of God's word. Our Lord, we pray you'd add your blessing to the reading of your word. Help us as we try to preach, Lord, move every stumbling block, every demon of hell, uh, each bit of animosity that might be there. I pray you'd remove it because I know the devil's going to try to hinder us this morning, but just help us to be faithful to your word. Help us to live uh, for your honor and for your glory, Lord, and do your work and do your will. Just help us, Lord, like only you can. Just help hearts and souls, Lord God. It's not about me. It's all about the word of God. You know, that's why we do what we do. I don't do what I do so that I can be seen. Uh, I don't want people to see Todd Cooper, but I want them to see you, Lord God. I want them to see uh, I want them to see you. I want them to see the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you just help hearts and souls this morning. If there'd be one lost, I pray you convict them and save them. Uh, one discourage, encourage them. One back, sit to claim them, Lord. You know, each and every need of each and every heart. And I pray you'd meet it according to your will this morning, Lord. For it's in Christ's blessing, and we do pray. Amen. And uh, amen. And so uh, looking here at our third point, which is the permanence of the Word of God. The permanence of the Word of God. Like it says there, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring, forever. And that's something that we can also bank on, is that God's Word is permanent. I know a lot of people might say, well... It's outdated, you know, that, that's, often a, that, that's often an argument by the critics, by Bible deniers. How is the Word of God still correct? You know, how is it still applicable to people here in 21st century A.D. when it was written so many years ago? You know, even, even if you accept, obviously as we do, I'm kind of talking like critics do, you know, even if we accept young earth creationism, uh, that the earth is only about 6,000 years old, then, you know, the Word of God's still pretty old, you know, even with the end of Revelation. 
like in AD 96, you know, when it was done, you know, whenever, uh, you know, whenever it was closed, whenever the Apostle John, uh, you know, finished up the book of Revelation, then, you know, that would mean that the Word of God is, you know, almost 2,000 years old, even if you accept young earth creationism. But it is still, friend, it's still correct, it's still right, it's still very applicable. <clears throat> It's still very applicable. I was telling my uh, my, my five-year-old daughter this morning, you know, kind of in her words, the way you would speak to a five-year-old, when I was studying, I was telling her how I can feel the Word of God. You can feel the presence still of the Word of God this morning. The Word of God is what changed my life. Now, I had the, uh, I had the privilege of being raised in a Christian home, and probably the greatest thing about my heritage would be the fact that uh, my father was a student of God's Word. Wasn't a preacher, but, uh, but is still a Sunday school teacher. And uh, my time as a kid, I remember my father studying the Word of God, you know, studying to teach Sunday school. Uh, you know, laboring in the Word of God. And that, that has had the greatest effect on my life more than anything. Is the fact that I had the Word of God instilled in me. And then, you know, I made that decision. Uh, like when I was, uh, like when I was, uh, of course, I surrendered to preach when I was 15. But I became more of a serious Bible student when I was 20 years old in the U.S. Navy. You know, once again, I know it's just how the Lord works, but it's almost also kind of humorous. You know, like when I was 20 years old, you know, when I, I read the biography of Charles Finney for I, I was doing a Bible college online correspondence. And one of the courses that I did was uh, the biography of Charles Finney. That school, they used a few biographies of great men of God. And, you know, Charles Finney was one of them, as he should be, one of the greatest preachers to ever live. Led, uh, uh, was one of the leaders of one of the greatest revivals that there's ever been. And, you know, that, that's uh, that's that's one thing that the Lord also really used to help me be more of a student of God's Word, studying that second great awakening. <clears throat> because the Word of God is still very real, because it is permanent. Yes, it's several thousand years old, but it is permanent, amen. Well, not several thousand, a few thousand years old. But it is permanent. It is still, it is still wonderful. Like it says there, it endures forever. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The Word of God is permanent this morning. Now we'll look at uh, Psalm 119, 89. You know, a very, uh, pretty familiar text if you're familiar with the Bible. Uh, but, uh, but a good one that drives this point home. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. You know, that, that word there, that, that's for all eternity from the beginning to end. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. You know, even whenever this first heaven and this, you know, first earth passes away, the Lord's word is not going to pass away. It's always going to be true. It's always going to be right. It's always going to be applicable. You know, that's, that's the one thing as believers, we'll kind of look at that a little bit more uh, here toward the end of this sermon. But the word of God is still very applicable to everybody living today. You know, it's, it's still the standard. You know, it is the standard. Like, I know, like in politics, there's a lot of talk now about being faithful to the Constitution. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, that has its proper place. But above all else, you know, what about faithfulness to God's Word? What about people honoring and respecting the Word of God? You know, that's why we have the problems that we do, because people don't do that. They don't honor and respect the Word of God. I'm not trying to be critical. You know, like I said there, whenever we opened up, you know, you talk about having a revival. You know, there, there, there are lots of independent Baptist churches, not as many as there should be, but, you know, there, there's still a great number of independent Baptist churches in the Bible, but, you know, just talking about independent Baptist, you know, that don't even include, you know, like Southern Baptist, American Baptist, and all the other Protestant churches, you know, that you have from, like, Virginia down to Florida, like, over to Texas, and then, you know, back up to Oklahoma, you know, and, like, back over to Virginia, you know, filling in Kentucky, you know, uh, uh, Kentucky and, you know, West Virginia, you know, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, all the other states in the Bible Belt. But, you know, there are a lot of independent Baptist churches in the Bible Belt. 
But then why haven't they seen revival? You know, how even now is the Bible Belt? You know, how is it so corrupt and so wicked? Because people do not love the Word of God. That's why. They do not make it applicable to their life. You know, I say that often. I'm not trying to be ugly. But, you know, independent Baptist churches, you know, even in the Bible Belt, they are so dead because they don't love the Word of God. They love the things of the world more than they love God. We we'll get into a lot of that because it's not really the sermon. It kind of is, and we say that often, but, you know, that's just God's honest truth. People need to get a heart for God. They need to get a heart for prayer. But, you know, they have so many hearts for other things. You know, like like in politics, you know, there are people that just strive, 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 you know, now for, for political purposes. You know, I actually asked that question before. You know, like with politics and sports, you know, what if people were as faithful, you know, to the word of God as they are to politics and to politicians and sports teams? You know, what if people, you know, what what if people, you know, strove, you know, strived and, uh, and, and, and fought for the Bible, you know, the way that they fight for these political causes? Like I was reading that article this morning, uh, you know, by David Cloud, like he was talking about it, you know, two, three years ago, like with Chick-fil-A, you know, whenever Chick-fil-A, you know, come under pressure because their late founder, I can't remember his name right off top, but I know he was a Christian man and that's wonderful. But, you know, they were, you know, like, uh, you know, liberals, you know, were going at him for, you know, making controversial statements about marriage because, you know, like I said, he's a Christian and, you know, he was simply stating that marriage is to be between one man and one woman. Yeah, truly, Kathy, that was his name. It just came to me. And, you know, that's wonderful that he's a Christian man. But, you know what? If people really fought for the word of God and for righteousness the way they fought for Chick-fil-A back then. And then, like, with the Duck Dynasty. You know, I'm not trying to be ugly or anything, but uh, I can't even think of those guys' names. But I know from what I read about them, I'm not really, really a big fan like the Robertsons. I know they stand for some good things. I think, like, a couple of them are preachers or whatever. But, you know, they're Church of Christ, and they've been like wrong things, and I know they were actually also endorsing alcohol. I never really was all that big on those guys. But, you know, like whenever they came under attack, like with that channel A&E, you know, like Bible-believing Christians, you know, were fighting for Duck Dynasty to stay on A&E. Now, I know that show, you know, probably is, you know, more clean than most things you find on television. But, you know, once again, you know, what if people fought for the word of God and for righteousness, you know, the way that they were fighting for Chick-fil-A, you know, and for Duck Dynasty to stay on the air? I mean, and it's good, you know, whenever you have Christians and, uh, you know, Christians, you know, who are public figures, you know, so to speak, but like with Tim Tebow, too. You know, like with Tim Tebow, you know, whenever people were coming out, you know, were coming against him, you know, for praying in college football in the NFL. And all. I mean, it's great that Tim Tebow is a believer. But, you know, what if people put that much energy, you know, into promoting the word of God, you know, as they did promoting these political causes? You, you know, what if people, you know, were riding the, the, their city halls and, and you know, do, doing, you, you know, doing those types of things, taking that type of stand for the word of God as there were those political causes? Because you might have got some minor victories in those political causes. But, you know, the word of God still wasn't honored by, by all of society. You know, like that article said, you know, when all that stuff was going on, you know, fighting for Duck Dynasty to stay on the air and Chick-fil-A, you know, there were still four more states during that time back like in 2017. I'm sorry, it was before that, I believe. Or it was sometime around that 2016, 17, 18, you know, when those types of things were going on the last, you know, three, four, five, six years. You know, with all that still going on, you know, th there were more states. Yeah, this would have been earlier than that, back like in 2014 and all, like when a lot of that stuff first started. Yeah, 13, yeah, 13 and 14, like with the Dynasty and Chick-fil-A when that was, you know, kind of first came on the scene. You know, th there were still states then, you know, that, uh, you know, that legalized same-sex marriage. There were states that legalized marijuana. Yeah, you know, then what did happen in 2015? You know, same-sex marriage was legalized for all the United States. You know, and even more states have legalized homosexual ma I'm sorry, have legalized marijuana. See, we got some minor political victories with Chick-fil-A being respected and, you know, Doug, Doug Dynasty staying on the air. But to be honest, that didn't really change things. No, it changed things at all. You know, word of God still wasn't honored by most of our political leaders. We still kept going in an Im in an immoral progression. We still we still kept going down the immoral road. It has not changed. It has not been converted. 
You know, it's not turned around. Why? Because people are not contending for the word of God. They're not contending for righteousness. People were fighting for Chick-fil-A and Duck Dynasty, but were those people being students of the word of God? No. Were those people praying for a few hours out of the day? Were, were they like Martin Luther, who said he prayed three hours in the morning because he had so many things to do? Not to pray three minutes a day, most people. You know, were they like the Apostle Paul in jail whenever he told Timothy, when, even when he was in jail before he passed away, please bring me the... Please bring me the books, but especially the parchments. Were they being students of the Bible? No, they weren't. See, people fight for these, you know, political causes like this. But even more so, more so, they should be fighting for the Word of God. They should be loving the Word of God like David does here. But that is exactly why we still have this downward spiral, even though we have a Republican in office right now, and might have them again. That simply isn't really going to change the great face of things, because the world's problems aren't in politics, you know, they're not in businesses and people being respected. It comes to a love for the Word of God. Because the problem is, it's actually our next point, that's good progression. People just do not fear God the way they ought to. If they did fear him, then why is it that they know more about sports, they know more about entertainment than they do the Bible? Because that's the truth, folks, people in the Bible, but I'm just being honest with you this morning. I don't lie behind the pulpit. Sometimes, you know, I confess things behind the pulpit because I'm honest, but right now I'm just preaching my heart, things that I see. You know, like here in the Bible Belt, you know, I can talk to people about the Bible, and within five minutes, within five minutes, people, you know, just cannot discuss Bible theology with me anymore after five minutes. You know, you start talking about things like the history of Israel and all. After five minutes, you know, they've told me just about everything. You know, just about everything they know about the Bible. Because the problem is, people are biblically illiterate. They are not students of the Bible. You know, most people around here, they, could name, they couldn't even name all books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You know, like you mentioned the book of Haggai to people. You know, especially the minor prophets, you mentioned things like Haggai, Zephaniah, Obadiah, Joel. You know, people don't even know those books are in the Bible. Because they're biblically illiterate, and that's why we've had the great falling away that we've had. Why is it that they had revival a couple year, a couple hundred years ago, and, and 300 years ago, like with the George Whitfield and the Wesley Boys, and Jonathan Edwards? They had revival because they were men of prayer. They were men who were students of the Word of God. You know, that they didn't spend five hours out of the day watching television. They spent several hours out of the day praying and studying the Bible. So like people here even in the Bible Belt, you know, within five minutes they can tell you everything they know about the Bible, even though they've been in church just about all their life. And they're like grown people. And even some preachers. They only talk five minutes about the Bible, but they can go on for hours about the sports. Hours about the sports, about conservative talk radio, about Fox News. Folks, the Word of God is permanent. That's what we're going to give an account to. You know, when people just contending for conservative political causes, that's nowhere near enough. It's not even the battle. Our battle is a spiritual warfare, not one of politics, but of spiritual warfare. And we better start fearing God. Verse number nine. Of course, our third point here, the permanence of the Word of God. And now letter A, the fear of the Lord is clean. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. We better start fearing God. Because that's what's clean. That's what's right. That's what's pure. Is the fear of God. I'll be honest with you folks. I hope Joe Biden don't win. But it's not going to make or break my day if Joe Biden wins. Because I don't fear Joe Biden. I don't fear the, uh, I don't fear Democrats this morning. I don't want them to be in, I don't want them to get into office. That's not where my fear is. I fear God. I mean, we had a bad liberal Democrat for eight years. You know, I was in the military even, you know, for some of that time. That guy, you know, who was in from, from 2008 to, uh, to 2016, you know, was my ultimate boss. But I didn't fear him or Democrats or liberals. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. 
Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. See, that's the conclusion of the matter. That's what really matters here. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That is the whole duty of man. That is our duty this morning. That's what we're supposed to be doing, is keeping His commandments. Fearing Him. I don't fear anybody else this morning. I fear God. And oh, if people would get to that state where they realize that is the whole matter, is that we fear the Lord. Psalm 111.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. See, there we got to praise Him forever. His praise endureth forever. And that begins with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. See, I know I've said that a few times lately, really ever since we started this ministry. That's something that I've always kind of meditated on. I guess maybe because the Lord called me to preach at such a young age, you know, when I was only 15 years old. You know, and I heard, you know, I heard, which, which that's good. I'm not playing about it. It's good. But, you know, I heard adults, you know, older people, especially preachers, you know, telling me to fulfill the will of God for my life. You know, now that God's called me to preach, if God wants me to be a missionary, a pastor, uh, you, you know, an evangelist or whatever. And then, you know, I've always meditated on that, you know, ever since my teenage years. How many people never really fulfilled the will of God for their life? You know, that's a sobering thought. Because, see, you fulfill the will of God for your life by praying, you know, you know, studying and reading the word of God. You know, that, that's how you get direction in your life. You know, that's what God has always used with me with direction in my life is the word of God. You know, that's his word. That's how he speaks to us. But, you know, so many people never fulfill it because of that verse right there, Psalm 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. People never fear God enough to get into his word. They never have godly wisdom, like, like we're saying there. We're talking about having a revival and everything. You know, it's sad, all these Christians, you know, even in the Bible Belt, in this day and time, how they do not have godly wisdom. And I know it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. We had some great preachers come from the South, you know, especially from yesteryear, you know, from previous generations. You know, some good, intelligent ones. And I know there's still some out there today, but, you know, like we had Harold Seitler and Oliver B. Green, Mays Jackson. <clears throat> You know, Lester Roloff, I know he did a ministry in Texas. I don't know if he was originally from the area. I think he was. But, you know, in this day and time of the 21st century, you know, that's just something that so many people miss. And I'm not just speaking on the Bible Belt. I'll say that because it is the Bible Belt. It's where I'm from. But, you know, all around North America, all around the world. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's just the beginning of wisdom if you fear God. You fear God. That'll be the beginning of wisdom when you become a person of prayer. When you become a student of God's word. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. Say we've got to do his commandments. We've got to walk in his will. It's his praise endureth forever. See that's our main point here. That's the permanence of the word of God. If you fear God. We're going to look at, at that at the very end of this here. But you fear God. There's going to be a good reward. If you do that forever. No, well, Matthew 10, 28. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not, but are not able to kill the soul. See, that's like I said, it's not going to ruin my day if, if Democrats get in office. Because even Jesus said, We're not to fear those who are able to kill the body. So if we're not to fear those who can kill the body, then that'd certainly go for anybody who can kill the economy or whatever else. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Because <clears throat> those people can't kill our soul. That's just the fact of the matter. You know, we belong to God, our citizenship ultimately. It's not on this earth, but it's in heaven. You know, God, you know, that's our ultimate boss, so to speak. You know, that's the only one that, uh, you know, that I'm to give an account to. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Rather than fearing these politicians and all. 
We ought to be fearing the Lord. So letter A there, the fear of the Lord is clean. And now letter B. That uh, second phrase there, verse number 9. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. That word judgments there in Hebrew, that means mishpat. Mishpat is how it's pronounced in Hebrew. That means verdict or divine law. Verdict or divine law, that's a concise definition of the word. Verdict, divine law. See, the Lord's verdict, see, first of all, the Lord's verdicts are right this morning. You know, his, his verdict simply, that they cannot be wrong. That's why it's good. It's good to let God examine us. You know, just like David often says, you know, throughout, you know, throughout the Psalms. You know, he says that, you know, Lord, try me, try my heart. You know, try my reins. That word range, you know, that means inner parts. You know, he's saying, Lord, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't just want to be judged, you know, by what's, you know, by my, by my external appearance or what, what I've done externally. I want my heart to be judged, the intents of my heart. Because, you know, that, that's what really matters is where our heart is. He's saying, Lord, you know, try me. You know, try me and my ranch. Try, try what I do externally and try my internal soul. Try my heart. Is my heart right with God? Saying like 1 Peter 4.17, wonderful verse here. This is exactly what needs to be preached in churches in this day and time. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? But see, let's just do that there. That's a wonderful thing to do. You know, Lord, try my heart. Give me a verdict of where I am right now. Am I right with you? Am I in your will? You know, although there are some areas that I need to improve on. Yeah, be true for all of us. We can always improve. But you know that that's just a wonderful thing. That that's a wonderful thing. You know that that's what I that's where I want. You know that that's what I had to do in my life. But that's what I really want. You know, for lack of a better word, I'm not trying to be ugly once again, but I'm just being kind of blunt here. But that's really what a lot of half-hearted Christians just need to do. That's exactly what they need to do. I just wish they would come to a place where they would humble themselves because it does take humility. You know, that's Second Chronicles 7, 14. They're humble themselves. You know, that that's the revival verse. <clears throat> if people would just humble themselves. You know, that, that's, that's what everybody needs to do, not just half-hearted Christians. You know, even people that do have a consistent walk with God, they need to improve. You know, what? but would just come to a place and say, Lord, Give me a verdict. You know, judge me right now. And give me a verdict of where I am. And I will start to go forward. I'll be a student of the Word of God. I will be a person of prayer. I will put God first in my life. Because, you know, that's just the issue with half-hearted Christians. They've never done that before. You know, and that's why we have the mess that we have. You know, that, that's why we've not seen a revival. That's why we've not seen a great awakening. You know, right now I live in central Alabama where there are Baptist churches all over the place. And, you know, like I said, that don't even include all the Protestant churches like Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, and Pentecostals, non-denominationals, etc. But, you know, here you don't hear a whole lot about God. You hear a lot about politics and Alabama and Auburn football, but you don't hear a whole lot about God. You know, you don't see God advertised like the way you see sports and politicians done. Now, I know that's most of the world. But the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And it'd be great if Christians, all of us, would just say, Lord, give me that verdict. Give me that verdict of where I'm at right now spiritually. Because the great thing is, you know, the great thing is, is, you know, that verdict is for right now. But if you still got breath in your body and you're still alive, then you can get your heart right with God. You can say, okay, Lord, you're giving me that verdict. And I know what I need to do right now. I need to seek God first. I need to get my prayer life right. I need to get a prayer life. I need to get a Bible study life. Matthew 4, 4. Actually, we'll start reading there. We'll, we'll read the first three verses there to help us out and to see where we are here. Of course, if you know the Bible, you know this is when Jesus was tempted by the devil. 
<clears throat> then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, of, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Of course, Jesus there is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. <clears throat> See, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, that's what we're to live according to. That's what we're going to give an account to. It's how we live our life. According to the word of God. Where it helps at Isaiah fifty five eleven. Oh, that's what we live by is the word of God. So we better get in it. We better know it. Isaiah fifty five eleven. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. You want to get going with your life. You want to get somewhere. Be a student of the word of God. Be a student of it, learn it, know it, and be faithful to it. Like, I'm not sure, I might have mentioned this before, a week or, might have been a couple weeks ago, and it was something on my heart. But like, I saw something on social media. Now, now the real meaning of this is right, but uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of added commentary, I guess, with it. Like, there's a thing that I often see on social media, you know, and like on, you know, internet pictures and things. It says, uh... It says, uh, I'm not impressed by people who can quote scripture. I'm impressed by people who live scripture. And I know, generally speaking, you know, that is true. But the thing is, most people, most people who know scripture are going to live scripture. Like if you just put, along, I guess along with being a student of the Word of God, like I'm a fan not just of reading the Word of God, I use that phrase often because it's true. Being a student of the Bible is a life-changing thing. You know, there, there was a big, I mean a huge transition in my life, huge. You know, I, I couldn't even describe it with, with, with any language, you know, with the words of any language. You know, when I not only just read the Bible, but when I became a student of the Bible, when I started studying the Bible... You know, I started using a Bible dictionary and, I mean, a Bible dictionary and a Bible commentary. Commentary is what I actually meant to say. But, you know, when I started using, you know, commentaries and, you know, you know, when I started to, you know, learn, you know, the background information of the books of the Bible, you know, the time that they were wrote, you know, you know, you know the, the, as much as you can about the author. You know, especially like with the history of Israel, you know, like with the prophets, you know, you know what prophets were pre-exilic. You know, if they were to the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom, and then you have like Jonah who was to Assyria, like Obadiah, you know, who wrote his book to the Edomites, Nahum, who wrote his book to the Assyrians, and then, you know, like during the exile, you know, like with Ezekiel and, uh, and Daniel, and then uh, like with the post-exilic prophets of Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi, and then, you know, like with the history books, you know, the time frame, you know, like of all those books, you know, about the kings and everything. You know, that's a life-changing thing there. It's life-changing. And then also, also, with scripture memorization, you know, that that's a big thing there. Like my wife has been telling me, you know, was telling me this last week, talking about resentment. You know, like she said, you know, scripture memorization, you know, has really helped me with resentment that I have towards people. Because that's what happens whenever you whenever you do scripture memorization. That's in your heart. That's in your head. But most importantly, that goes to your heart. You know, if you just if you just do one verse a week, it's great if you do more, two or three, whatever. But if you just do a verse of the Bible a week for scripture memorization, you know that in conjunction with other things, like I said, using a Bible commentary, you know, using a Bible dictionary, because you know a lot of the words. You know, out of this King James, well, well, for starters, a lot of words, you know, are really just, you know, spiritual, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, would be religious, you know, or spiritual words that, uh, that, that we don't use very often. And then a lot of words, you know, used like in the, you know, used in the English King James are words that we really don't use anymore. Or like back in, back in 1611, you know, they were words that had a bit of a different meaning than they do now. You know, that's why it's great if you have a King James Bible dictionary. 
<clears throat> or also, if you know what words mean, like in Hebrew and Greek. You know, like in Hebrew and Greek. You know, like with Isaiah, you know, 55, 6, you know, that word seek there, you know, that comes from a Hebrew word. Like if you look up what that word means in Hebrew, you're going to get more meaning out of that. Yes, I believe the King James Bible is inspired. It is the preserved. It is the preserved word of God from Hebrew and Greek. But there are lots of good things that we can also glean from, from learning Hebrew and Greek. And it's a life-changing thing, you know, when you become a student of the Bible. Not just whenever you read the Bible, but when you, you know, study the Bible. You know, you know what biblical words mean. And also, you know, whenever you do scripture memorization. So, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, you know, that is right. You know, not just quoting scripture, but living it. But, you know, most people who know the Bible are people who live godly lives. You know, the people that I know, especially Christians. I mean, like I said, these people that... You, you know, unfortunately, quite a few people I know, you know, who are members of independent Baptist churches, you know, you know, that, you know, who I would consider to be half-hearted Christians. I know I'm not the final judge here this morning, but we are to test all people by the word of God. You know, like it says in Thessalonians, prove all things. You know, 1 Corinthians 2.15, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. You know, we are to test everything according to the Bible. But, you know, most people I know, though, who live half-hearted lives are people who simply don't know the Bible you know, th those are people, you know, like I said, those are people who could who could tell you all they know about the Bible in five minutes. But, you know, they could go on talking all week about sports, politics, or some other secular thing. <clears throat> so, you know, it's very important there. You know, we know the Word of God. You know, you become a student of the Word of God. It will certainly change your life. So let it be there. God's judgments are manifestly true and righteous. And now let her see here. Let her see. We go to verse number 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Let her see. Desire the word of God more than anything. And that's the issue, you know, what we were just talking about there. People do not desire the word of God. You know, that, that's just the fact of the matter. Fact of the matter. They're more into pleasing their flesh and entertaining themselves than they are knowing the Bible. But the Bible is a lot, lot, lot more profitable than anything. That's what the verse says there. You know, it's better than fine gold. It's sweeter than honey. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. You know, you can't even compare what the world has. You know, silver, gold, rubies, any type of entertainment. None of it is a match to the Word of God. You know, and when, when, whenever you first start doing it, you'll get a heart for it. Like it says over there in the New Testament, you know, talking about being addicted to the ministry. You'll get addicted to the Word of God. You know, I love studying the Bible more than anything. I mean, I know God called me to preach. I love preaching. No, you know, I love studying to preach. I love studying the Bible. You know, just like David said there also in Psalm 119, you know, it's sweeter than honey to my mouth. It's greater than anything. Receive my instruction and not silver. You've got to receive the word of God. And knowledge rather than choice go. You've got to get the knowledge of the word of God. We've got to get this knowledge. That's why churches are so dead. They do not have the knowledge of the word of God. There are far too many people who are biblically illiterate who are just ignorant about the Bible. For wisdom is better than rubies. Godly wisdom is greater than anything. Better than anything. And all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. It's better than gold. It's better than silver. It's better than any ball game. It's better than any politician. It's better than anything on television. It's better than any sale down at the mall. It's more wonderful than anything. Verse 19 of Proverbs 8. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue than choice silver. Because see, the fruit that you will get out of being a student of God's word is better and greater than anything. It's the greatest work that an individual can do is to labor in the word of God and see the fruit of it. Like the name of the church that I plant, that God has us plant, it's God's church, it's not mine, I'm just a steward of what God has given me. But the Lord's church that he allows us to be a steward of, that he allows us to plan in his name, 
the name of it is probably is probably either going to be Word Baptist Church or Northern Word Baptist Church because, like I said, it's way up north. I might just call it Northern Word there to give us a little bit of Northern New York distinction. But it's going to be all about the Bible. And the fruit that we get is better than gold. Yea, than fine gold. Our revenue is better than choice silver. There's nothing like the fruit that comes from the ministry. And that fruit comes from being a student of the Word of God. Why are preachers so dead? Why don't churches see any fruit? Why don't we see souls saved? People don't have power. They don't have power because they're not in God's Word. And they're not in prayer. Psalm 119.72 Psalm 1972, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. It's even David there just talking about the law, the books of Genesis to Deuteronomy. It's better than thousands of gold and silver. Because it'll help you live the right lifestyle. It'll do great things for you. Psalm 119, 100. I understand... More than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. That word ancients, that's just talking about the elderly people. David is saying, I understand better than elderly people do, because I keep the word of God. You want to have real understanding? You want to have real knowledge? You want to have real wisdom? You've got to get into God's word. It's wonderful. It's great. It'll help you more than anything does, than anything can. John seven seventeen. This kind of answers the question that I had. Well, not really a question, but uh, kind of just goes along with the statement that I made. Why is it that so many people, you know, just don't fulfill the will of God for their life? They don't do all of what God would have them to do. John seven seventeen. Jesus gives us, uh, kind of gives us that answer. Of course, I've really already answered it, but just, you know... In conjunction to it, John 7, 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. See, if anybody will do the will of God, they're going to know the Lord's doctrine. See, in order to do the Lord's will, you've got to know God's word. You've got to know his doctrine. You've got to know what his word says. There are far too people. Who really know that? Going back here to Psalm 19, kind of winding down here. Got a couple more, uh, just a couple more sub points to go, then we'll be finished. Now starting in verse number 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. See, we've been warned by God's word. See, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. There's absolutely, especially in this day and time. There is no excuse to not know God's word. There, there's no excuse to not know his will. Amos chapter 3 and verse number 7. A very, very applicable book here to uh, to the day and time that we live in. I guess that's what we just completed with our minor prophets class on Thursdays, the book of Amos. And like if you you know me and my ministry, you know that uh, that I make a striking, because it is, I'm not the only one other preacher as well who know the Bible. You know, there's a very, very striking contrast between the minor prophets and, uh, and then the day and time that we live in now, particularly here with Amos and Jose, who were prophets to the northern kingdom, whenever the northern kingdom was in much disarray and living ungodly. But it says in Amos 3, 7, he says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Like in verse 8, The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? See, we've got the Word of God. We've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. See, and there certainly is no excuse for us in this day and time, people. 
None at all. Like all the resources that we have, you know, that like like everything that we've been saying here. You know, for starters, we've got the whole canon of the Word of God. We've got the whole canon of the Word of God. If you speak English, you've got it in English. Other languages have it. I know not all of the languages do. But some of the languages have it. But, you know, this is, this is a sermon in English right now with the English King James Bible. You know, we've got all the Word of God. Like I mentioned, we've got numerous good Bible dictionaries, uh, Bible commentaries. You know, a multitude. You know, a multitude of resources here to help us study the Bible. Now, I'm glad we're not left to ourselves. you know, this morning. I said, I have, I have a dictionaries, I have commentaries, I have a Bible encyclopedia, you know, we, we have books, you know, volumes and volumes of things. And, and even more so now, you know, with the internet, a lot of those things you can get for free. You know, you can get on BibleHub.com and, you know, just right there. Have numerous commentaries, Bible dictionaries, and I know not all of that is exactly biblically right, but, you know, the vast array of it is. Most of it is good biblical stuff that you can bank on. You've got the sermonlight.org, I believe that is. You know, just, just so many resources. I mean, things we can even get for free. You know, like with our tablets, you know, you can even download, you know, f you know free, either free things or things very inexpensive. You know, on tablets, you know, we have a printing press, you know, we have ebooks, like I said, all of all the good stuff on the internet. I mean, there's just no excuse. You know, in the 21st century, you know, there, there, there's no excuse to be ignorant. If somebody's ignorant, it's because they choose to be. It's just because they choose to be, you know. But John 15, 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you, even the words of Jesus. It's been made known unto us by Jesus Christ and the Gospels with his words, by the Apostle Paul. You know, with more up church and pastoral epistles than more books by, by the Apostle John and, and Peter and the book of Jude, the book of James. And as we said there, with all of the Old Testament, you know, which was also written for our learning. I went not under the law anymore. You know, everything written in the Old Testament does not directly apply to us like with the law. But, you know, there's even a lot of great things we can get, like from the book of Hebrews, which is actually my favorite book of the Bible because it's all about God's holiness. Of course, I'm an Old Testament guy. I love the Old Testament. But there's no excuse here this morning. Now, I don't want there to be an excuse for anybody, you know. That's why I do my ministry. Like, I know deaf and, like, my wife is deaf. I didn't mention that. Like, I know I mentioned us planting churches in northern New York. Like, if, you know, if you're just watching this for the first time. But, like, I... But, um, like, like, I'm, uh, I'm doing, uh, doing a deaf ministry. Like, I believe I mentioned that tonight. That's why uh, at night time I preach in voice and in sign language because I reach deaf people. I have a deaf wife. And then I also have a great burden for blind people. I'm printing Braille Bibles, how blind people read. It's actually what I'm doing right now. I'm writing a Bible dictionary that I'm going to print, you know, just put in English print for, you know, even seeing people to read. But I'm kind of primarily writing that for blind people to print that in Braille. Because there aren't as many resources for blind people. You know, I'm glad blind people can hear. So, you know, they can hear preaching, you know, and everything. And they can hear the word of God on, on tape. But, you know, that, that's not the same as reading, though. That certainly isn't the same as being able to read the Bible with their hands like they do. And being able to study the Bible. That's why I'm going to print a Bible a dictionary in Braille. You know, and, and other commentaries. Commentaries that I've written. And also going to try to print, you know, the uh, the older commentaries. By the by the great, uh, you know, by the great Puritans and theologians of the, like of the 1700s, 1800s, and early 1900s. Because <clears throat> there should be no excuse for anybody. You know, and that, that's why we have missionaries that go to other countries. But especially us here in North America. You know, people that know English, we are, you know, we are definitely without excuse with all our resources and everything that we have. You know, that there's no excuse at all if somebody is ignorant, it's just because they, they choose to be. You know, if somebody's not memorizing scripture, you know, it's just because they choose to, you know, they choose to entertain themselves with television or whatever else, you know, rather than memorize Bible scripture. You know, they choose to do things that please their flesh, you know, than they do being a student of the Bible. Then last phrase here in verse 11, we'll be through, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Letter E, there is great reward if we keep the word of God. You know, like we've already gone through that, how we are to desire the Bible more than anything. 
you know, we've already touched on, you know, how great our fruit is. You know, that fruit is greater than anything that the world has. And there is a great reward. There are crowns that we can get if we keep the Word of God. Now, that, that's kind of that, you know, little phrase that I mentioned that I saw on social media. Yeah, you know, that's people who also know the Word of God, but then that's people who put the Word of God into action. People who keep the Lord's commandments, who live the life. You know, I kind of, you know, rail on, you know, the way that I do about being a student of the Word of God because there are so, so few people that do that, unfortunately. So we've got to know the Word of God. In order to live the Word of God, you got to know it. But then after you do know it, you've got to live it and be faithful to it. But I believe this, the majority of the battle, though, is becoming a student to start with of the Bible. And Proverbs 29, 8 will be the last verse that we uh, that we read here this uh, this morning. 29, 18. I'm sorry, that's 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18. This is actually a bit of a missions of a missions verse here. But like I said, though, this is putting the word of God in action. Proverbs 29, 18. All of it. Where there is no vision, the people perish. I know that's often the little phrase there, you know, that a lot of missionaries use. And it's right. You know, it's right. You know, that that's exactly what I see there for, uh, you know, for, for northern New York. You know, that's also, you know, pretty good, too, for blind people. Like I was just mentioning there, that's good good progression of the Word of God, you know, even with where my heart is. You know, like with reaching deaf people, you know, and, and blind people. Because, like I said, deaf people and blind people, you know, they're, they're two of the biggest unreached people groups in the world because, you know, they are so, you know, cast out by society. You know, there's so few things for deaf people, you know, and for blind people. Like I mentioned me, you know, writing a Bible dictionary for the blind, you know, like that. I did that because I couldn't find one at all. You know, I looked on all these Braille bookstore websites and everything. You know, and there is another organization that does print Braille Bibles, but only one. But, you know, of all that, you know, I couldn't find anything. For, for a Braille Bible dictionary. So where there is no vision, the people perish. You know, we've got to have that vision. And look at the last phrase there. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So you'll be happy if you keep the word of God. You know, that, that's, putting our, you know that's putting our faith into action. And uh, like I was going to say, that's not just for missionaries, it's everybody. But you know, in a sense, everybody's a missionary. You know, even if you live, you know, in the Bible Belt, you know, your community, the people that you work with, you know, that, that that's your responsibility. That's your ministry. I know that can be hard. You know, like you work with lost people. I know a lot of people, you know, they don't, they don't get along with, you know, their boss or their co-worker, especially if they're lost people. But, you know, keep that in mind. Lost. Lost. You know, you've got to have a heart for your own community like I do. Not like last Saturday, you know, I might, I don't uh, like... <clears throat> Like I was just, uh, you know, tell, telling my wife, like if you're familiar with our ministry, you would know. But, you know, if you don't, you know, when I first went back into full time ministry about a year and a half ago now, like back in the spring of 2019, you know what I was going to do? I was just going to start a I was actually going to start a church for the deaf and the blind, like here in Alabama, because Alabama does. Alabama actually has a pretty sizable deaf and blind population itself. But, you know, the Lord led us up to northern New York because I honestly, I simply don't have a, I don't have a God called burden for Alabama. You know, there's only, there's, there's actually three places that I have a, that I have a real big burden for. I can honestly say that I have a burden for the world. I can say that honestly. I know a lot about other countries. You know, I've done a lot of research about other countries and all with my interest in missions. But, you know, I have a God called Burden, northern New York. I also have a great burden for Ontario, Canada. That's where I was before. You know, I went on several trips up to Ontario, you know, before I ever moved there. And I also have a, the third place, I also have a burden for Vermont, which is actually our other neighboring mission field, you know, to our east. And Vermont was a, was a place that, uh, that uh, me and my family actually also, you know, came close to going. But, you know, like I said, we went to northern New York, but we also prayed and looked at going to Vermont. You know, which is our neighbor. And and then and, and after we moved to northern New York, that's actually something we're going to do. We're going to start a church in northern New York, but we're going to go across both of those borders. Uh, we're going to go over to the west, to Ontario, where we were. And, uh, you know, we're not going to start a church there, but, you know, we're going to go there and do Bible studies. going to pass out tracts, going to witness to people, you know, as much as we can. Then we're also going to go over to Vermont, you know, particularly northern Vermont, like over in the Burlington area, you know, in that area. 
you know, and also, you know, street preach if we can, you know, pass out tracts, you know, go witness to people, go try to, uh, go to go try to get to the deaf people, because like I said, eastern Ontario, you know, that they have a large deaf population, like where we were, and then also in Vermont, you know, that northern Vermont, they have a pretty large uh, deaf population as well. And so we're going to go over there. I'm going to try to reach the people. You know, that, that's where I have a, you know, those are three places that I have a really big burden for. <clears throat> you know, that, that area right there of the north, of northeastern North America. You know, but, but even here, like I said, in Warrior, Alabama, you know, I went street preaching last Friday here in Warrior. You know, and this is a place that I do not have a God-called burden for. I've got a burden for it, but not a God-called burden. You know, it's not where the Lord wants me to live my life. But, you know, even while being here, you know, what am I going to do? Just sit around? You know, I could just sit around and study and write books. That's a big part of my ministry. And I want to make that disclaimer, too. I'm not saying everybody here ought to be a Bible scholar. You know, yes, you know, I, I do study. I study I study more than the average person does. I study even more than the average preacher does because, you know, so that's part of my calling. You know, that, that's a gift that I have. You know, I have a gift to study and write, and I'm exercising my gift to the best of my ability. But, you know, I'm not just going to do that. I'm going to do what I did last Friday. I actually meant to mention that when we started in, you know, in our prayer time. And I flat forgot. And we got a couple of big ones coming up. Like on Halloween, you know, which is uh, this coming Saturday, you pray for us. We're actually going to go out and street preach all over Warrior and Hayden. These are two relatively small towns, but we're going to go all over. We're going to go all over downtown Warrior, and then we're going to go to Hayden. We're going to go like to uptown Hayden, and then we're going to go to downtown Hayden. And pass out tracks, do some street preaching. You know, even though this isn't, you know, a place that I have a God called burden for. You know, I, I tried to stay here and live here. But, you know, it's not where God called me. But, but for you, friend, you know, you know, that's for you. Like, even if you're, you know, if you're not a preacher, if God's not called you to preach, if God's not called you to, uh, you know, be a missionary or whatever, you know, that verse there in Proverbs twenty nine eighteen, that's applicable to you. You know, where's your vision at? You know, where's your vision at? You know, if you're just in, you know, if you're just a, a member of a church or whatever, you ought to have a burden for your community. You know, you're to go, you're to go out, you know, visiting in that community, soul winning, telling people about the Lord, passing out tracts. That's not, it's not just the pastor's job, a preacher's job. It's not even just the deacon's job or the Sunday school's job. If you've been saved by the grace of God, it's your job. It's your obligation to put your faith into action. You know, where there is no vision, the people perish. You know, what about people you work with? What about your neighbors? What about people in your community? You know, that, that's your mission field. You know, that, that's your obligation. You know, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Well, I really don't have a burden for the people. Well, then you got to do one of two things. You got to pray God give you a burden. Or if you still don't have a burden for the area, like me, that was my situation. <laughs> I still really didn't have a God God burden for the area. Then say, well, Lord, where do you want me to go? You know, move there. And then, like I know also, I've had a lot of people here just kind of over our first year doing this ministry. Like I know there are some people who listen to us because they don't have a Bible preaching church in that area. You know, there's people like in, you know, in northern New York and Ontario, you know, who have, uh, you know, you know, who have, uh, who have listened, you know, watched our preaching, you know, and teaching videos because they don't have a Bible preaching church in their area. And unfortunately, you know, that, that's the situation, you know, that that's the situation even in a lot of parts of North America. You know, that's why we're doing our church planning ministry to northern New York and going over to Ontario and, and going over to Vermont. But, you know, you've got to make the most of that. You know, if you don't have a Bible preaching church there, the Lord still wants you to stay there in that area. Then, you know, you've got to go out and be the witness that you ought to be and make the most, make the most of your uh, situation. If God has kept you in that area that don't have a Bible preaching church, then you definitely ought to be praying for a preacher to come start a work in your area. Will that ever come? I'm not sure. Not God. But I do believe that, though. If you plan on staying there and living there in that area, then you better be praying for God to call a preacher up to start a church there or... You know, or either, or either number two, you know, you need to move to an area that does have a Bible preaching church. But, you know, I'm God, that's between you and God. But, you know, like I said, you know, I've, I've dealt with people like that. You know, people in, you know, other parts of North America that don't have a Bible preaching church. <clears throat> no, no, many, many parts of the world don't, unfortunately. But uh, that's the message here this morning. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Did not mean to go this long. But we get everything. That we can out of God's word, that ought to be, amen. 
That's what you'll do if you're a student of God's Word. If you love God's Word, you'll do all that you can to get everything out of it. And so thank you so much there for being for being with us. It is, it is a life-changing thing being a student of the Bible. And so you continue to pray for us. Pray that we do the Lord's work, do the Lord's will, and uh, be what the Lord would, uh, would have us to be. Amen. As we're certainly praying for everybody out there. And we'll close in prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you so much for the time in the Word of God this morning. Oh, how wonderful and how challenging it is, Lord God, to live according to your will. And I pray that we'd all be faithful, Lord God, to what we ought to do to build your kingdom. Just bless the brethren and sister, and we pray uh, just to help us all to be right and do what we ought to do, Lord God. I pray for those communities that don't have Bible preaching churches. I pray more would come. I pray you'd use us to do that work, Lord God. I know we're starting our first church in northern New York, but Lord, I pray that maybe through our through our ministry, more people would get a desire for Vermont and for Ontario than for other parts of the world. You know, there, there could be a young person or a middle-aged person, you know, who comes and listens, you know, to this sermon, and you, you could call them to be a missionary. You know, that, that could be to, you know, that could be to New York, Ontario, Vermont, or it, it could be somewhere else. It could be to Africa or Asia, you know, Lord, whatever you want them to do. You know, I pray that they just be faithful and we'd all do what you'd have us to do, Lord God, to plant churches, to support missions, and to be students of the Word of God. It is a life-changing thing, and I pray we would all do that, Lord, be a student of your Word and walk in your will and in your way. I pray the devil would stay defeated because I know the devil's going to fight, Lord. The devil's going to fight all of us. The devil's going to fight us. But the devil's going to try to discourage us. You know, it's already happened to me. You know, I've made some good progression in my spiritual life this year, but the devil's also fought me, unfortunately. You know, he's fought us hard. He's going to do that. And I pray be with all the people who listen to this message, all the brethren and sister in the faith, that you just touch them, encourage them, and help them, Lord God, and be with us all the way we ought to be, Lord God. And we'll prepare for you on all the praise and all the glory for all because you have it, Lord. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, man, thank you so much, folks, for being with us. Be with us tonight. Be preaching in voice and sign language, continuing our series in humility. And until the daybreak and the shadow flee away, I am Brother Cooper, and I love you.